and welcome once again to EWTN Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. A special bookmark coming to us from Rome is Father Wojciech Giertik, OP, author of The Mystery of Divine Love, published by EWTN Publishing, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, for all things Catholic. And it's great to see you once again, Father Giertik. We, we talked several years ago when you were actually here at our Irondale studios. Yes. I remember that. Right. So let me ask you, you've got a book, The Mystery of Divine Love. Now, this was given as a retreat uh, to lay women uh, several years ago. Why was it geared towards women, or is it geared towards women? And is the book geared towards women? I don't think it was particularly geared towards women, but it was just a group of ladies who had asked me to give the retreat, and I was in the United States, and so I accepted to, to preach to them, and they arranged it. So. They, they came together themselves. They have their own okay. connections. And, and so um, I preached it, and they recorded it, and then they asked to have the, uh, the, the retreat published. Right, okay. And now that's in, how the book appeared. Now, in the forward to this, uh, you've got a couple of homilies, and you actually have the actual retreat itself. Right off, you say, toward God, we need to be straightforward. Well, if divine love is a mystery, how can we be straightforward with God? Well, we, are, we can be straightforward if we don't complicate things. Mm -hmm. God is living in a mystery because God is greater than the capacity of our mind. So in faith we accept the greatness of God that, that we cannot fully comprehend Him. But uh, uh, in our relationship to God, we can be straightforward if we accept that we are in His hands. And so we give to God our past without worrying too much about our past sins, which have been absolved anyway, but sometimes we worry about them. We can give the future because we don't know the future, what we believe we're in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And so we live in the present in a very straightforward way, happily that we are in the hands of God. And, and this facilitates the relationship with God. Whereas if we have too many ideas or we, have too, we are too much worried about things past or future, then this blocks right. the, the quality of our engaging with God. And that's why you refer to the idea of, of hiding behind a mask adults do as opposed to children who aren't like they're, they're simple and direct in their relationships. Then you go on to say, then the true self course, is, yeah. never, is never shown. What is word is never presented to God. Basically, this difficulty is not psychological but spiritual. But doesn't God already know who we are? Why do we have to present ourselves to Him? God knows who we are, but we sometimes have a false image of ourselves. The image that, you know, what we, how we want to see ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and this may be positive or negative. Sometimes we have an, uh, 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 an excessive image of ourselves in pride, or sometimes we have a too a bad image of ourselves. We just have a, a, a lump of all our sins put together, and this is, we think this is who we are. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to let go and accept, you know, uh, that the, the relationship may be direct, like children who don't mm -hmm. remember about past faults, and they quickly change, you know, and, and they live more uh, the present moment. Huh? You, you're talking about a balance so here, right? It's not a question of informing go right. And you talk about a balance about here, about a balance in a sense. You say we need to be yeah. like children, of course. We also need to be adult and responsible in the face of worldly challenges. Isn't that really the challenge for all of us? How do we find that balance? Well, uh, I, I use that, uh, that expression because often in Poland I saw people had it ups upside down. Mm -hmm. The idea that we have to be strong and powerful in the face of God to prove to God that we are good so that ultimately God will look at us and uh, an incapacity of being responsible in the practical life. And this is a consequence of communism that people uh, didn't have the perspective of liberty which mm -hmm. we have in the West. And so I saw that this was a common error, and that's why I often insist towards God, we have to be simple like a child, trustful like a child, whereas it doesn't mean we have to be infantile in the face of life 
we have to be responsible. We have to take, mm -hmm. uh, you know, take the challenges and respond in a creative, uh, adult, mature way, mm -hmm. doing what we have to do in life. But towards God within what we're doing, we need to maintain this trust towards God. Now you say if we locate and we our... we also need to ensure... Go ahead, Father. We need to ensure that, uh, that we nourish our relationship to God in, a, in an adult way. So we have to organize our prayer life, our reading of scriptures mm. and so on, so that we can relate to God as a child. You say, if we, re if we locate our deepest hope within the mysterious divine providence, if we try to love God even poorly, but truly with our meager little gifts given to us, given to Him, we immediately open up divine graces. This is fundamental in liberating. Why is that an important point? Well, the question is whether we live out our lives uniquely on the basis of our own efforts or whether we live out our lives uh, accompanying God, you know, in the presence of God, you know, allowing, permitting the grace of God to work within us. So the more we relate to God, the more we bounce off our difficulties in trust towards God, we bring in the power of God mm -hmm. into what we are doing. Huh? And so we as if are opening windows huh, to the fullness of, of divine life and love, mm -hmm. which may then penetrate uh, the nitty gritty of our everyday chores of whatever we're doing, huh? mm -hmm. things great or small. Huh? Right. Well, you mentioned here, and I thought this was interesting, we should not be bothered by the fact that we shall most likely not be known saints. Well, you know, I am a consultor for the congregation for now, the dicastery for mm -hmm. the causes of the saints, you know, and mm -hmm. so I have to study these long volumes where they study the various candidates and to assess whether the virtues mm -hmm. were heroic or not. Well, I prefer that nobody will ever do this with me, you know, <laughs> to study my life, all the details, and to wonder, you know, what, what, were my virtues heroic or not, you know. That's not important. Mm -hmm. It's important to relate to God, you know, to be authentic, you know. Whereas whether we will be declared saints, you know, other people will worry about this. Hopefully they won't worry about this after mm -hmm. our death, you know. That is not essential. Right. My guess is that when we get to heaven, yeah. we'll be surprised at who some of the holiest people actually are, people we've never heard of. I guess that's your point, right? We've never heard, of course, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And maybe people who lived next to us in our city, on mm -hmm. our street, you know, and we never knew about that. Huh? Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you have several homilies. The first homily you, you, is, talks about Lazarus and Martha and the death and, um, you know, where our, our Lord came to Martha and said, open the tomb. And, and the declaration, yeah. she said, so a declaration of faith is not yet sufficient. For, you say faith has to seep into life in all our reactions. Then you go on to quote St. Augustine, who talks about three moments when Jesus raised someone. Three types of sin he relates it to. Yeah. Sins that have just happened, sins that lead to permanent oh. death in the soul and death of the supernatural life, and sins that cause decomposition and stench. Why is that important that we understand those three? Yeah. Well, uh, Augustine uses these three scenes of the Gospels where Jesus raised people from the dead and, and uh, uh, insisted that we believe that whatever is our situation, God can liberate us from our sin and bring us back to the fullness of, of, of engaging with God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people have this tendency to, to cross themselves out, you know, I'm so bad that nobody can help me. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, it may be a question that we've just fallen into a sin, or it may be that somebody is deeply rooted in sin, somebody is, a, is addicted to sin, mm -hmm. and, and it seems that there's been so many, you know, conflict situations that nobody can help me, but God can help you. Huh? Right. And even the good thief hanging on the cross, you know, uh, he was a thief, really. You know, he was he he was uh, condemned for true mm. true crimes that he had committed, huh? and yet he was the first canonized saint huh? and canonized right. by Christ Himself. Huh? Now, one of the things you, you talk about in the, in the in your first conference, you, you're talking about the woman who touched our Lord, uh, who was considered ritually unclean, yeah. and you talk about how the woman triggered the effusion of divine yeah. power. And you say, Jesus could only make miracles when he met with faith 
which was exercised. Sometimes people look and they say, well, what, how, could the, how could God be limited by anything? Well, uh, but God wants to engage with us. Mm -hmm. God wants uh, uh, basically a, a friendly relationship with Him. And so when we trust in God, mm -hmm. we open up, you know, the, 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 the perspective, the, the place, the, the space for the grace of God to work. You know? mm -hmm. And that's why the virtue of faith is so important because it triggers, when it's exercised, it triggers uh, sparks, you know, right. uh, the power of grace. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, have, you actually talk about the spark. Sometimes people declare, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes people declare, you know, yeah, I, I am a Catholic, you know, I am a believer, you know, but practically in the face of life, you know, they ignore God. Uh, right. Whereas it's important to move in our spiritual life in such a way that whatever the difficulties, challenges, big or small, uh, mm -hmm. we invite God into them. Well, it's interesting, too, because you talk about a spark plug and the ignition of the supernatural life, and you quote in here uh, Cardinal Dulles talk about the yeah. baptism and first, first uh, expression or installation, you know, of uh, installment of our supernatural life. But then you go, you, 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 you kind of related uh, the woman and the Lord with contemplative prayer, and you always think, well, what does contemplative prayer have to do with exercise? or exercising your faith? Well, contemplative prayer primarily is the exercise of the theological virtues of faith, which is followed by hope and love. Uh, there is a certain difficulty that the word contemplation over the centuries has acquired a different meaning. Okay. And, and it also means uh, the, uh, inst the, the uh, simple intuition mm -hmm. of a truth. Uh, so we can have a philosophical contemplation, a mathematical mm. contemplation, mm. an aesthetic contemplation. We see a wonderful view and we say, wow. But that is not contemplative prayer. If you have a genial mathematical you know, intuition, mm -hmm. which is great for mathematics, that is not prayer. Whereas contemplative prayer is the engaging of our faith, hope, and love towards God. And that's why uh, people who are not intellectuals, who are not philosophers, may have an authentic contemplative prayer. Children may have an authentic contemplative prayer as they relate to the living God. Okay. It's interesting, too, because you, you really place an emphasis on baptism, something that we kind of either take for granted or don't think a lot about anymore. And you, you talk about it as, as like receiving a computer program. How so? Well, uh, baptism is the, uh, always the church has right from the beginning insisted on the necessity of baptism. Now, we do not deny to God the liberty of granting his graces even before baptism. And many people who have never been baptized and never heard the gospels, mm -hmm. if they believe that God exists and, rewar and God rewards those who, who search for him, even within a pagan religiosity, they begin this relationship with God and they may be true saints. But certainly baptism uh, gives us the certitude mm -hmm. and the, uh, the adult who's asking for baptism already has faith, uh, mm -hmm. which leads him to baptism. But once the sacrament is conferred, there is certainly uh, the fact that we receive all the, uh, the, the, the supernatural graces that are necessary to to lead us mm. to the heights of sanctity. Right. But they are installed in the depth of the soul and sometimes they're forgotten uh, and not used. So that's why a retreat is important, a moment of prayer and an invitation and a good book to invite people to exercise, to use the, uh, the gifts that they already have in them as a result of baptism and of course, the further sacraments. Right. Now you talk about, in, 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 throughout this book, uh, you, you, you talk about uh, not only contemplative prayer, you talk about mercy and God's mercy. And of course, people would think right away, well, divine mercy, he's a Polish priest. Uh, he must have a great devotion to divine mercy. Uh, she must be, Faustina must be his favorite saint, but she's not, is she? Well, you know, I'm a Dominican, so I've spent <laughs> many, many years reading Aquinas. You know, I've had read the diary of Faustina many years back, but I've certainly I've had a much greater the greater impact on me in the theology of Aquinas and also in the works of Saint Therese of Lisieux, mm. whom I have read and there's much more in her writings than in that of Faustina Kowalska. And I prefer Saint Therese because 
uh, of her sort. She explains things better, and and she had no visions, no mm -hmm. extraordinary sort of events. Uh, and I, I don't have any extraordinary visions. And so what she says about the exercise of mm -hmm. faith of living out the relationship with God is closer to me than uh, I find that uh, more helpful, you know, mm -hmm. than the writings of Faustina, but I don't deny the sanctity right. of Faustina. <laughs> Do you think that's why Therese is so popular in general with Catholics? Well, Saint Therese is extremely popular, and there are many, many beatified and canonized saints of the 20th century, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who had a profound devotion to Therese, mm -hmm. and who found in her writings uh, a spiritual nourishment. And in fact, her mission began in the church after her death when her writings were published. Right. At the funeral of Therese, I think there were only 12 people present. Mm -hmm. But when the sisters published her, uh, the uh, autobiography, and immediately it, it spread and people asked for more copies, right. and so it was out of print, they had to print new copies. And in this way, uh, she was known through her writings and of mm -hmm. course through her intercession from heaven. Now, one of the points you make in the section on power as an exercise of faith, you talked about uh, children and how they can learn contemplative prayer, etc. But you say there was a tragic error in catechesis around the 70s and 80s uh, when it was suggested that children should not be told things that they cannot understand. Why was that a problem for the church? The idea of not telling children things that they that they cannot understand mm -hmm. meant that the most important truths of faith were deleted and children were invited to move from the realm of faith to the realm of reason. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if they discover they don't understand something, they reject it. Whereas it's important to maintain in our minds this openness to the divine mystery, which is greater than the capacity mm -hmm. of our mind. And as we go on in the pilgrimage of our life, mm -hmm. we constantly encounter situations, difficulties, uh, unknowns, uh, uh, moments when we don't know where we're going, mm -hmm. but God knows, God is in charge. And if we persevere trusting in God, we're not living on a pure, rational, logical way, we're living on the level of our faith. Huh? And mm -hmm. for children, this is even easier than for adults to trust and to believe. Mm -hmm. So in catechesis, they should not be shunned away from faith to a purely rational thinking, which they're also engaging in as they're studying arithmetic and, and mm. other subjects. But they need to maintain this relationship with the living God in faith. Right. You say faith is a divine gift, but it's a very fragile gift. Why is it so fragile? Because we can easily sniff, uh, snuff it out, you know, mm. and we can easily ignore it. Huh? But it's a fragile gift, but it's a very strong gift. It's like a little plant which has the power of growth. Huh? And sometimes it may seem that the faith is completely, you know, dried up, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not there. Huh? And nevertheless, you don't need to be rebaptized in sometimes external conditions, and suddenly faith is reborn again. Huh? So it's very resistant, even though it's, we could say it's flimsy. It easily mm -hmm. disappears from our attention, you know, from our awareness, because we're so involved in other things, and we, and we, uh, we fail to recognize this dimension of faith in our lives. So. But it's now, there if we be baptized. Now, you talk about the mystery of divine love. You say the more we grow in our faith, the more the mystery becomes mysterious, becomes dark until we learn, like St. Peter, how yeah. to walk on water. How, how does that happen? Well, you know, as we go on in our life, you know, we are faced with various challenges, difficulties, and sometimes, you know, external ones, sometimes within ourselves. And uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't think that things will become clearer, that immediately, you know, we will know it will be sort of bright and, uh, and clear. No, we live out our lives in the darkness of faith. And so the image of Peter walking on the water, huh? Sometimes we think it's easy, you know, to walk mm -hmm. on water if you're from a country like Poland, mm -hmm. where you can walk on frozen lakes, you know. It's simple when the lake is frozen. Huh? Mm -hmm. But the image of Peter is that when he had faith, huh, he was going towards Jesus. But when his faith was quivering, huh, mm -hmm. then he suddenly started to, uh, to sink. Huh? Right. So we have to have the courage huh, to 
to have the solid foundation in our lives that is walking on water. Okay. And then that, we're living out our lives in the supernatural way. You go on to point out in the book, human nature is in, paradoxical. Right, absolutely. Human nature is encompassed within the divine project. You say, but somehow in modern theology this yeah. was shelved. How so? Well, somehow it seems that this, this moment of the um, of, of uh, the God's encompassing attention was forgotten and the focus was more on philosophy, on looking at creation, looking at the world, you know, arriving at the conclusion that there has to be a prime mover, an ultimate end, that there's coherence in the cosmos, everything is functioning, moving and so on. So uh, beginning with, uh, with a philosophical reflection and then treating the eventual engaging with God as something extraordinary. Now that is incorrect. Uh, of course, f uh, grace is not a part of nature, but it's not something that happens only to extraordinary souls locked up in convent somewhere, you know, in the distant world, you know, mm -hmm. and not in ordinary life. Uh, we need to engage with God, you know, wherever we are, you know. I was preaching mm -hmm. this to a group of lay women, you know, in their lives, in their challenges, you know, in, their, uh, in whatever is facing them, you know, they can bring in the power of God. And, and even though they are not religious sisters, you know, they're not nuns. Whereas mm -hmm. in modern centuries, there was this sort of idea that grace is somehow extraordinary and the whole explanation, the whole teaching often fell on the level of speculative philosophy Mm -hmm. of trying to convince people about God and about the working of our life and our moral challenges and morality mm -hmm. and so on. It was all as if presented with a purely natural language and the spiritual life, the engaging with God, was treating, treated as something extra, as something superimposed mm -hmm. for the chosen few. That was a double-decker bus. Uh, that's a double-decker bus Vatican image you use yeah. in the, uh, right. Bus image, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Whereas Vatican II rec reminded us that we're all called to sanctity. Right. All people, lay people as well. You know, huh? Right. Now let me ask you, why is Herodias the only negative character among women in the New Testament in your mind? Well, do you know any other negative character in the Gospels amongst the women? I don't personally. Uh, the wife of <laughs> Pilate, but even right. she's a... She is a positive candidate because she had a dream, you know, she was concerned, you know. Mm -hmm. All the other Jesus, all the other women in the in the Gospels, uh, engage with Jesus, mm -hmm. where it's only Herodias is a is a negative character. Right, right. You also go on to talk There's about no Pharisees amongst the the women amongst the Pharisees. Okay, right. They always they always come out doing well. Uh, in, the, in life, there are in true life there are sometimes women who are Pharisees, but in the Gospels we don't find them. That's interesting. Uh, do you think that was on purpose? Yeah. I don't know. But, right, okay. Uh, Just wondering. But uh, it seems that, that from the feminine mind, there is a maybe a more easier approach right. to the exercise of the theological virtues and engaging with God. Whereas we men are too complicated right. sometimes. Well, you also. And we complicate right. issues and then we don't have the ability. Right. And the ability to bounce off uh, towards God. You also talk about, in a sense, the way sometimes people, you know, back away from kind of the image of the Father, certainly in the Old Testament. Certainly some of the women in the Old Testament were pretty tough, too. In the Old Testament, well, yeah, okay, there's, there's, there's more characters that <laughs> in there, think right. about that. Exactly. But, but, certainly the, but certainly the image of the Father in modern centuries mm. has been distorted uh, mm. in, in the... In antiquity and in the Middle Ages, the father was never painted. Huh? Right. Whereas the idea of a terrifying father who's out there to punish, huh? right. this is wrong. Huh? Right. We find the father through the son. Christ is the image of the invisible father. So it's through Christ that we find the relationship to the father. So why do you, why do you uh, think that Jesus called uh, the men on the road to Emmaus who didn't recognize him, in a sense, called them foolish? Why are they foolish? Because they were, uh, they lacked uh, hope, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, they they had their own projects, their own imagination, uh -huh. and to jump towards the mystery, uh -huh. 
and to view everything according to the eternal project of the eternal Father. Mm -hmm. Because Christ there says in the inner conversation to them, you know, the, he refers to what had been planned by the eternal Father. And so the Paschal mystery, the death and resurrection mm -hmm. of Christ, which is the great gift uh, of, of, of God through which we can be uh, atoned from our, from our sins. We can, we can be washed out of our sins. And in our own understanding of, of the evil that we've committed, mm. we often lock ourselves in that. Whereas the atonement, the redemption, is given through the total gift of self of Christ. And this was planned by the Heavenly Father. And so it's a sign of the love of the Heavenly Father for us. Now, the, uh, the disciples on the way to Emmaus didn't see this. Uh, mm -hmm. But when Christ explained it to them, then the reading of the Old Testament became different and their hearts were burning as he was explaining to them the scriptures uh, and also explaining to them their own lives, whereas they had their own uh, hope, uh, which was purely natural, and that hope was shattered. You know, they had political expectations of the Messiah and that was shattered, huh? but right. that was something positive because Christ was leading them to the theological hope. Huh? Right, absolutely, and that's why you talk about the, the so fact hope that... centered on him. Right, that ideologies are human hopes that we try to impose upon God. We try to force God to do things according to our right, way. Yeah. As we persist in them, we're foolish because we fall out of filial relationship with the Father by doing that. And in this purification of our, of our projects, it's not only a question of purifying our hopes from bad things that we want to do, which is obvious, you know, we should not, mm -hmm. uh, not have bad hopes, uh, but also the purification of good hopes, mm -hmm. that we have a good project ahead of us, which we need to have. Uh, we're not to be sort of passive and locked, but we are not to sort of be locked in the conviction, God, you have to ensure that it works out my way. Uh, right, absolutely. Even the good projects, have to be purified through the mystery of Christ, you know, and, right. and then goodness will come out in ways which are completely unexpected. Absolutely. One last question, because we're just out of time. You say, we will find out our vocation at the moment of death. Isn't that a little late? Well, <laughs> the point is, we find out, you know, what to do now. <laughs> God shows us, you know, what are we to do now, you know. But the entire meaning of our life, you know, sometimes that deaf people recall back, you know, mm -hmm. and see one particular moment which is most important, you know. Whereas if we think that, you know, that we can ha know everything at the beginning mm -hmm. and we're just then living out our own project, huh, then we're imposing something on God. You know? Okay. So at the final moment, God will tell us what was the most important moment. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Father Wojciech Giertik, OP, author okay. of The Mystery of Divine Love, published by EW10 Publishing, coming to us live from our studios in Rome, available through the EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com, all things Catholic. We'll see you next time. This has been EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Kennedy.